Thank you. Before we begin, I'd just like to remind everybody that the board is not permitted to speak on any personnel matter. And to that fact, we've asked our the school district attorney, Mr. John Gross, to join us and speak to that matter a little. Sure. Good evening. Um, school boards are government, and as government, there are certain significant limitations on discussion regarding uh, the employment history or behavior or um, uh, performance of employees. In the private sector, uh, there is greater latitude in discussion, subject, of course, to a private employer being sued for defamation, saying things that are untruthful about an employee. But in the public sector, as government, we're governed not only by good employer-employee practices, but we're governed by the United States Constitution and the New York State Constitution. And both those documents, which most of you are familiar with, provide, uh, for example, under the Federal Constitution, the 14th Amendment, that government may not deny uh, employees, persons who have what are called property interests, um, due process of law, nor may they invade, government may not invade the privacy interests of employees, notwithstanding whether or not what was done was true or untrue or bad or good, that may not be divulged in public. Uh, there are other statutes, for example, the Open Meetings Law of New York State, indicates that a board can go into an executive session to talk about the employment history of an employee to avoid the risk of besmirching that employee or violating the Constitution or the New York State Constitution uh, relative to uh, uh, their rights and interests. So um, as and I, I understand to folks who are concerned about a particular issue that that is uh, tough to tough to uh, uh, accept uh, and in some respects to understand, but I assure you that I've been practicing law, as you can tell by the white beard, for an awful long time. I can assure you that, that it, what I've said is correct and is the law of this state and this country. So I have directly advised the board to respectfully refuse commentary regarding this issue, why a vote was taken or not taken, uh, uh, at the last session. However, none of what I said, uh, other than perhaps um, good practice, applies to those who wish to speak. You may speak and say whatever you wish to say. However, challenging the board, asking the board why you voted this way or that way, because of the privacy interests and these statutory requirements, um, the board really cannot engage in a dialogue. So the board asked me to make this statement at the outset so you understood uh, why if you were to pose a question I would ask you or suggest that you not pose questions but that you make the statement that you uh, feel is important to make uh, because I've advised the board uh, that they should not be responding to inquiries concerning uh, this most recent vote. Thank you Mr. Gross. Uh, before we open the mics, I'd just like to remind everybody, when you come up to the mic, please state your, your name and address clearly. And please remember that you are addressing the board as a whole, not one individual board member at a time, or not, you're not to address the audience individually. You're, you're here to speak to the Board of Education, and we are five members, and that's, that's who you're addressing, the five of us. Um, I would like to open the mic up to any students who would like to come up first. Uh, not that you have to but that you have the privilege of coming up first and speaking, and then anybody else who would like to. We have a lot of people in the auditorium, so I'd like to ask that everybody, you know, keeps their comments as brief as possible. We'd like to not have this go more than two hours long. So. No students want to come up first? Okay. Hi, I'm Karen Parker. Um, my address is 37 Southern. Avenue, and um, I'm here to talk about the recent decision by three board members to vote down the contract renewal of the two girls varsity soccer coaches. 
Just two months ago, at a board meeting, this team was honored and congratulated for their achievements. The girls on the team and the coaches that led them were celebrated. One of these coaches had just been named Newsday Coach of the Year. You all proudly stood behind these ladies and posed for a picture. I don't currently have a daughter on this team, but I am here tonight and I'm concerned because I care about the athletic community at Southside and I especially care about the students. I'm also a member of the Athletic Advisory Committee, and for anyone here who um, doesn't know, that's a new um, standing committee in the district comprised of coaches, community members, administration, um, and Board of Ed trustees. Um, back in November of 2019, after accusations of uh, conflict of interest were made, this committee was formed, and our first task was to revise the district conflict of interest policy. This comprehensive policy not only covers coaching, it also includes tutoring and instruction in the arts. I, along with the other committee members, spent literal days of my life on this task. Over the course of our work of thoroughly reviewing and rewriting, the policy was continuously discussed at board meetings, revised and sent back to committee for more work. At the board meetings, the public also had time to comment. So 10 months later, on September 10th, 2020, the policy 640, 6480 was passed by the board with a four to one vote. At that meeting, in regards to the policy, um, the majority seemed very pleased with this policy and there were statements made like, um, I believe it's in the best place it can be for us at this point and I hope that we can all move forward with it. But that if it doesn't work for us here in Rockville Center, we'll look at it again. We try and craft policies to work for our school district. We're willing to listen and take that all in. Don't be afraid to come to us if you feel something has gone wrong with this. Well, something has gone wrong with this. Based on the fact that both coaches were recommended by the superintendent and the athletic director, we can be confident that there was no reason to decline their renewal. In fact, to do so is unprecedented. So what was the reason? The conflict of interest policy was followed by the coaches. So was the policy procedure then ignored by the Board of Ed? Why have a policy at all? Were there issues that these three trustees knew that were so compelling that they felt it necessary to vote in this way? If so, shouldn't those issues have been brought to the superintendent? I would love some answers. And I sincerely hope that each board member will use their time speaking later tonight to explain and defend their position. I hope that those who overuse the word transparency will practice what they preach. I want to hear how this decision was in the best interest of the students and how they'll benefit from it. But before my time is up, I understand I can't ask questions of the board trustees, but I'm hoping I can ask Superintendent Chang, were you informed of any reason that these coaches should not be renewed? From my administration, no, Carol had recommended them to me, so I recommended them up. Are you confident that this Board of Ed is capable of making a non-biased decision in this matter? I think the board can make the decisions and vote the way they decide to vote. Okay. Thank you. I think the board has the right to vote and has the right to vote the way they deem it to vote. That's going to be my response. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Parker. <laughs> Brian Madden, Esquire, 385 Morris Avenue, Rockville Center. So we have a soccer team who less than four months ago won the Nassau County Championship. Now with its two championship winning coaches, ironically, two months from this very day, this board honored these players and these coaches in this room. This is an extraordinary statement. 
And the fact, this fact alone requires further scrutiny of the actions of this board. To help the community understand, I offer a brief review of the board governing process. Written policy is the law that governs the schools. The board makes policies through its voting process. The board, the superintendent is hired to carry out these policies, making decisions on a daily basis. If the superintendent follows policy, approval by the board will be routinely given, unless there are extraordinary circumstances. What went wrong here? Policy 6480, as Ms. Parker just described, one of the most stringent conflict of interest policies of this kind in, of any school in Long Island. I, I could not find any that were anywhere near this stringent and this detailed of a conflict of interest policy. It was approved by the Board of Ed in September of 2020. The policy was formed by members of our community. They spent their time. It took a, over a year to develop this policy. These people are not hacks, as some people described up here at this podium. Hacks are community members. It's terrible. No other school has a strict or a specific policy. The policy was adhered to by the athletic director, the superintendent, and the coaches. And a list of coaching candidates met their approval. And following the policy, it was put forth before the board. Even though they adhered to policy 6480, both the head coach and assistant soccer coach were not approved by the board in a three to two vote. Less than a month from the start of the season and no plan for succession. One can only surmise that the, the lack of leadership was purposely done to throw this soccer program into chaos. And that's where we are right now. This is chaos. Unless the board has, has had extraordinary information that made very clear that the policy was not followed, they should not have overruled the superintendent as per the law. And that's wrong. And it's not just unethical, it's illegal. If the board did have extraordinary information, why did they not share it with the superintendent? If the board did have extraordinary information, why did they not share it with the other board members? It makes no sense. If the board had extraordinary information, was it shared with these coaches? Were they told? why they were not put forward. I don't think so. If the board had extraordinary information, was it shared with the union? I don't think so. Maybe we'll ask them later. Maybe we'll find out. These actions are not just wrong or unethical or illegal. They have created a significant legal liability for this board and, is for, and for this district. This board has gone rogue and we are prepared to hold it accountable. This rogue board must consider its actions and reinstate these coaches immediately. A failure to do so highlights this board's dis dysfunction, leaves the soccer program without direction, and sets off further legal consideration, adding to the already $30,000 which we uncovered in a FOIL request for the initial investigation of, of these coaches, which was solved two years ago, as far as we thought. But now it comes to light yet again. Unbelievable. This board has lost the confidence of the teachers, the students, and the community. What, who does this board serve other than itself? It makes no sense. I urge this board to correct this dictatorship government governance, lead by consensus, and begin the process of repairing these tattered relationships because that's what they are, tattered, and reinstate these coaches tonight. Thank you. I appreciate the time. My name is Michael Haynes, 36 Combs Avenue, reluctant witness. I've sent my children to Rockville Center schools for 23 straight years, and I never thought that it'd be necessary to address the board. But here I am. I've had my children get cut from teams, from soccer teams. They were devastated. It's always traumatic when a high school athlete gets cut from the team they so desperately want to make. It can be one of the most disappointing days in their young life. And for all the young girls that got cut, especially in recent years, I hope that they are doing better 
and I hope that the school is being more sensitive in how they handle that part of the process. These young people need to be treated with respect and with care. However, after the cuts that my family suffered through, my wife and I handled things quite differently than the people that brought us into this horrible situation. We never called the athletic director, the principal, or the superintendent. We never filed a lawsuit. We never went to both social and mainstream media in an attempt to create a completely false narrative and label it pay for play. And we certainly did not make this a mantra to run for the Board of Education simply to try and exact revenge on people believed to have done us wrong. That would be crazy, that would be wrong, and it would send the wrong message to our child. I know the path that this lectern has gotten some considerable wear over the two years that this has been going on, and I can see some of the old familiar faces are here again. We'll hear the same stuff. But having the most people to speak at a podium on what we're calling here open mic night doesn't necessarily make your case correct or your facts accurate, but I can tell you right now, everything I'm telling you is fact. They made false and misleading statements, this group did, to try and create a, this hysteria we find ourselves in. They would tell anyone that would listen to them in an effort to gain some traction. They ran with this on social media and enlisted Confederates to further their own personal cause. I hope that at some point, some of these folks in our community realize that they have been either used or bought just to further this charade. This is all for what a few people wanted as their own personal revenge. This has nothing to do with the betterment of the students in the community. It's just a cloak that they hide behind. So why am I here right now? Why now, two years late? Well, the board has heard so much about this, but you haven't heard from us, the principals in this, the folks that these other people have viewed as simply collateral damage in this whole thing. It's been very hurtful, and most importantly, you haven't heard from the students. And when you hear from that and them, that's going to be sobering. They're hurt by this ugly saga, and it has no end in sight. When will it end? As respectful citizens and as parents, we can't stand, stand by and let this continue anymore. It's wrong, and frankly, it needs to stop. Like many Southside girls before her, my daughter decided on her own that she wanted to play soccer at a higher level than the Rockville Center program had. So my daughter tried out for a club called East Meadow, and she made it on her own. It was an open tryout that any young lady could have tried for, publicized, and she took part in it. Now, other than paying a nominal tryout fee, there was no money exchanged for this. We had no idea who the coach or the trainer was going to be. This competitive team would be in a competitive market, in a competitive league, and the, this was the league that was not supported by the Rockville Center Soccer Club. Is money have to be paid for this travel team? Yes, money has to be paid, because you're practicing three nights a week and two games on a week. The girls have the soccer ball on their foot five times a week. There's a cost for field time, refs, insurance, uniforms, tournament fees, coaching. One can almost use the analogy, it was like buying a luxury car. You were just simply buying a better product. Is it worth noting that in addition to East Meadows open tryouts, they also have a program in place to financially assist the players and their families that can't handle the cost on their own. It's not just about the money. Players that play that much soccer acquire better ball skills and they get in better shape. They are going to get better. It's just that simple. That should make perfect sense to a reasonable person. Maybe some of these girls made the Southside team because of their ability. In the end, it's really that simple. It's not some conspiracy theory that a few people want us all to believe. Now let's, let's talk about conflict of interest that gets thrown around here a lot these days. Conflict of interest, a situation in which a person is in a position to, de to derive personal benefit from actions or decisions made in their official capacity. At the October 22nd, 2019 Board of Education meeting, a person we'll call a concerned citizen said the following after their child did not make the varsity team. And I'm quoting, I can't speak about someone in power who said something to my child and how my child was treated by this district, it's absurd. It's absurd that the privacy interest of your staff takes precedent over the privacy interest, rate, interest of my child. Now please note, this person says my child three times. 
who have established the personal aspect of this. Now, after this person didn't get what they wanted, this concerned citizen said, you know what? I think I'm gonna run for the board. This slogan, this campaign slogan was a catchy one. ACT, A-C-T, what did that stand for? Accountability, communication, transparency. Please note all of those words. This candidate would actually brag to friends and acquaintances that if elected, the soccer coaching situation would be taken care of. Now, on June 1st, 2020, in a one hour virtual meeting, a meet the candidates for the board, because we're in the middle of a pandemic, folks. This person did not mention one time the soccer tryout issue, not once. What this person did say was interesting. The, the quote goes, and again, I am giving a direct quote, the board should adhere to open meeting law. Stop moving so many matters to the executive session behind closed doors. How are we to hold our elected representatives accountable without a public vote? There has been a systematic veil of secrecy surrounding the major controversies in the district. Again, this is June 1st, 2020. Another quote, it is time to lift the veil. Another quote, the public is entitled to know what is going on with people of the district. And then the topper. I know that people want to ask questions of the board, as, as council said. But this particular person as a candidate said, and again, a direct quote, because when council says, we can't discuss personal issues, this candidate said, the quote starts here, there are ways to communicate information about topics to the public without violating personnel issues, without violating people's privacy. How ironic is that? Unbelievable. All right. No comments from the audience, please. We're listening to this gentleman. Please don't comment. I would like to ask the board if there are any comments at this moment, but I don't think so. The whole candidate forum was, well, you can be the judge. I would view it as a sham and as a misrepresentation to the general public on what this candidate really stood for and what they were really about. But how do we know that? Well, after winning the election and the very first reorganization meeting, on July 1st, 2020, this person, now a trustee of this board, took a sworn oath to the U.S. Constitution, the state of New York, and the bylaws of the Rockville Center Board of Education. Moments after the swearing in, the soccer tryouts and the coaching situation was topic one. We're still in a pandemic, folks. Topic one. In fact, this trustee was told by the board president, you are, quote, turning this into a personal matter. This trustee's, this trustee's anger also extended over to the dislike of the district's law firm, which I believe is still Ingerman, Fer Ingerman Smith. Is that correct, sir? Yes, sir. Thank you. Are you aware that she was not, or the, I'm sorry, the board member was not happy with the responses from Ingerman Smith during the initial investigation? Uh, you are asking something that borders on the attorney-client privilege I cannot answer. You're an attorney? Correct. And you're representing who? The board, the corporation, and the highest governance body, which is the Board of Education. Are you representing Ingerman Smith also? I, am rep I have an obligation to my client. I just said that I cannot comment on anything that impinges on the attorney-client privilege. Can you answer, are you representing Ingerman Smith? I am representing the Rockville Center School District. So I'll take that as a no. Okay, because I just want you to know, this particular board member was very unhappy with Ingram and Smith. <clears throat> you folks are in their sights. Now, the most recent dagger. Mr. Mr. Hines, I, with, with all due respect. Excuse me, it's Haynes. I, I'm sorry, Haynes. There are a lot of people who want to speak here tonight. Yes. Okay. 30 seconds, I'll be done. Okay. I apologize. The most recent dagger directed at the members of the community. The one that brings us all here took place on July 21st, 2021 as the absolute very last action of the school year, three board members, including the one that has had this personal conflict of interest for two years exacted their desired revenge in a cold, calculated matter of fact. They denied the two soccer coaches their chances and our student athletes chances to defend their Nassau County championship. The coaches' names weren't even mentioned. 
They were referred to as line items, numbers. It was like a mob hit. Blindsiding all teachers, coaches, community members, and most importantly, the players, our student athlete, athletes. It was another shattering moment for these girls. What kind of people do these sorts of things? Just moments after this meeting was adjourned and the lights turned out, there was no statement or explanation about this to the community, no communication, no transparency. We've established from earlier quotes, there was a clear motive of revenge for the perceived wrong done to one's child and that the new board possession, the new board member would allow revenge to be executed. Mr. This I, is I'm sorry. direct and clear conflict of interest and under New York State law, this trustee should have recused themselves from this issue and the board members are also at fault for allowing this to occur. Thank you. I, before you speak, can I say something? If the comments keep going on, we're not going to be able to accommodate everybody in the room. So if it continues, we're going to have to put it three. Because we have a two hour limit on the meeting. Listen, please. Well, we're not. We're, if they continue to go that long, we're going to have to put a three minute limit on. Go ahead. Policies keep operations from dissolving into complete chaos. What this board has created and proliferated is an extremely chaotic environment surrounding our athletic department as a whole and specifically setting an accusatory and slanderous environment for our girls varsity soccer program. This chaotic environment has recklessly harmed the very people you are each tasked to protect. We can all agree that it is hard for young ladies that do not make the Southside soccer team. We can all relate and understand the disappointment there. But it is not okay to target the girls who are on the team, you have made, who have made the team on their merit, who have shown up, and who have been recognized as leaders in their sport. Every month or so since August of 2019, these girls have heard about suspensions, potential firings, possible lawsuits, and board meetings in which people question so many of the things they have worked so hard for. Many of these girls have been called down to meet with administration, have been asked to meet with district lawyers, and have been questioned again and again. Things said at board meetings and by parents and adults around town trickle down, affecting these girls' lives in ways most in this community don't see and can't even imagine. A current board member had an outburst at the October 22nd, 2019 board meeting in which she alleged that players who made the varsity squad traveled all summer on a college tour with the assistant coach and paid him directly, an outrageous and patently false lie against the very students she is sworn to protect. The deceitful campaign against these girls found its way to other students' Instagrams, TikToks, and Snapchat accounts. These kids have been ridiculed for paying to play since 2019, a ridiculous falsehood started by adults and now passed on to young people in our community. These young ladies are continuously bullied and harassed through social media, a campaign that is still going strong to this very day. At a time when the mental and emotional health of our young female athletes is in the headlines, this should be a scary and sobering fact for this community. Most of the girls don't share with many others what they are up against, but that doesn't dampen the impact and mental toll that, th that is there. In fact, I think it makes it that much scarier. You have failed these kids by creating an environment of questions, accusations, and hearsay, and not following district policy that is in place to pr protect our students and our staff. You have toyed with the reputation of distri district staff members and the very students you have the most serious duty to protect. Please, it is time to show your support for these children. Thank you. Um, Emma Madden. 
As a member and captain of the girls' varsity soccer team, I want to assure you that the integrity of the girls' soccer program at Southside is strong. It is built upon the strength of our character, determination, work ethic, our camaraderie, and our commitment to the game. We feel strongly that we have represented Southside well, and we couldn't have done that without the leadership of our coaches. We work very, very hard. We deserve to be supported by our superintendent, administration, board of ed, and community. Over the last two years, we were met with an issue that impacted our school team greatly. As someone impacted directly by this issue, I can say that I am extremely shaken by the lies and rumors spread about me and my teammates. I have had to defend myself and my teammates over and over again. There were many times I felt so frustrated commenting all the lies. After a year in which everyone was confronted with so much change and hardship, our soccer season gave us a sense of normalcy. Our coaches were a big part of making it such a positive experience. This season, our team was extremely close. We became a family, and I can't imagine losing two people who help hold our team together. Our county win was one of the most amazing moments of my life. Having the opportunity to share it with some of my best friends and coaches who care so much about us all is something I will forever be grateful for. After the amazing season and county win we just had, I am heartbroken and frustrated that we are expected to go through this upcoming season without our coaches. I especially believe that after such a hard year, we deserve to have some stability, and that comes with keeping the coaches that led us to a county championship. My fellow captains and I have struggled to explain what's going on to the rest of the team. We don't have answers, and we don't know what lies ahead. Our season begins in one month, and we feel lost going into our senior year without the coaches that have carried us through high school for the past three years. These coaches have left have left a lasting impact on all of our lives, and I truly am devastated that the decision to remove them from the coaching staff was so casual and out of nowhere. I hope that you will find a way to give us back our coaches. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Emma Hospaka. I'm a member and captain of the Southside Girls Varsity Soccer Team. I'm extremely disappointed and frustrated by the board's recent decision to remove my coaches. I believe that I can speak for all the girls in saying that this past year was like no other. That being said, the soccer season brought some normalcy and enjoyment to this otherwise uncertain time. Our coaches turned our team into a family and encouraged us to thrive not only as soccer players, but as young women. This bond and their ability to help us reach our potential resulted in winning the county championship. It is my understanding that the Board of Ed is supposed to make decisions based on the best interest of the students. I do not see how removing two highly respected coaches after such a successful season benefits the team. The misinformation that is being circulated and supported by certain board members is harmful and makes us feel targeted and discriminated against as student athletes. Furthermore, these false accusations have resulted in the bullying of several team members. The board's actions have diminished the team's accomplishments. You recognized us as county champs only to punish us by removing the two most vital members of our family. We are now entering our season with negativity and uncertainty due to your malicious actions. As someone who has strived to play at the highest level, I have played on competitive travel teams throughout my entire career. I always considered my commitment and dedication to the sport an accomplishment. Playing at this high level is the stepping stone for me to continue my soccer career at the collegiate level. Your direct actions and spread of misinformation dismisses all my hard work and makes me feel even more targeted and discriminated against as a competitive soccer player. This decision is detrimental to the team as a whole as we start our season without our talented and committed coaches. I can assure you this decision is not in the best interest of my team, the Southside student athletes, or the entire Rockville Center School District. I urge you to reconsider. Hi, Brenna Haynes. I'm a rising senior at Southside and a member of the girls varsity soccer team. I was also a member of the East Meadow soccer program. Over these past two years, there has been much speculation over the teams I've been a part of and the relationship between the two. However, none of the dozens of board meetings addressing this topic have heard from the individuals these decisions are affecting the most, the student-athletes, until today. 
the Board of Education's main priority is to create a safe learning environment, both inside and outside of the classroom. However, as a member of the Girls Varsity Soccer Team, I have not felt very supported by our school board and other community members. I have experienced harassment and cyberbullying by both parents and students these past two years. Now, as many of you may know, this past school year was the premiere of Source of Strength at Southside, a universal suicide prevention program designed to focus on the students' strengths and unique qualities. I've been fortunate enough to be selected as a peer mentor for this organization, and I found it quite empowering to both connect with other students and faculty in the district, while also identifying the things that get me through the tough days. Well, playing soccer is one of my sources of strength, and these coaches were my trusted adults. I find it quite ironic how the school board funds a program to help with students' mental health, yet the same school board is making decisions with collateral damage to student athletes. Starting in August, <laughs> starting in August of 2019, parents have harassed and publicly shamed me and several of my teammates and our families. It is now two years later, and the harassment has only gotten worse, spreading to social media and cyberbullying from other students. The fictional pay-to-play campaign has led to this bullying, and I have felt personally attacked. TikTok videos displaying Southside students holding up the middle finger with captions such as, F Lady Sick and F This Program, gaining thousands of views over five different accounts. These videos received comments stating, never paid to play, and I stand by that. And at least we can say our parents have never paid anyone for us to make a team. In addition to these disturbing TikTok videos and comments, Instagram stories were posted by fellow Southside students mocking the girls' varsity soccer team on various occasions. Screenshots of visuals used by the players to help raise awareness for the recent rally, as well as pictures of the shirts sold last season, were used to mock and belittle us. These false accusations have had a detrimental effect on student athletes' mental health, making me feel unworthy of being selected as a member of the team. Cyberbullying is not what Southside nor what Sources of Strength stands for and was a direct result of the campaign started by a current board member based on false information. I'm asking the board to put this situation to rest and stop the continuous harassment my teammates and I have received. Please reinstate our coaches so we can continue to rebuild the girls' soccer program at Southside. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kayla Hubler. Last season, I was a freshman in this school and a rookie on this team. The coaches in question allowed myself and the other rookies to feel welcomed and a part of this family immediately. Unfortunately, the Board of Education has now left a void within this family that we have worked so hard to build. We as a society have gone through enough in the last two years due to the pandemic. The Board of Education has now made it even harder for student athletes to live their day-to-day -day lives. The coaches in question are not just qualified, they are proven to be overqualified as we ended our last season with a county championship title. Not to mention our head coach earned Newsday's Coach of the Year. I am devastated to say the least and I, want, I just want our coaches back. These coaches push us to daily to find our true potential and without them we won't know if our true potential can truly be achieved. After the amazing season we just had, I'm heartbroken that we are expected to go through this upcoming season without a part of our family. It is extremely unfair that our coaches have been let go after the prestigious awards they've previously earned. That being said, I feel that the Board of Education should reconsider their poor decision and give us our coaches back. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Charlie Duret. I'm a rising sophomore at Southside High School. The last year and a half has been a challenging time for all of us. It has been especially challenging for myself as I moved into a new neighborhood and started school in a new district during a pandemic. Soccer has been a very big part of my life. I've been playing organized sports since I am five years old. 
I've had many coaches and I played CYO for years. In addition to CYO, I played travel soccer for many years. Today I play for a nationally recognized soccer club, Sousa Academy. The bonds that I have formed with my teammates, coaches, and families has been invaluable. When I moved to Rockville Center, I couldn't wait to try out for Lady Sick. I knew that soccer was very big in Rockville Center and that excited me. I lived in Queens and went to school for eight years in New York City public schools and we never had a soccer team because there wasn't enough interest. One of the best things that happened in my life was that I was a part of a team that won the county championships during the most challenging times in history. This soccer program changed my life. The girls, their families, and the coaches made me feel like I was part of the program and community forever. There was actually something positive that came out of COVID. I moved to Rockville Center and I played on the varsity soccer team led by two amazing coaches. So you can imagine that hearing the news that our coaches will not be with us next year was heartbreaking. These two coaches prepared and led us to the county championship. Our head coach was even named coach of the year by Newsday. Why would they not be rehired? I as well as my teammates and families just don't understand. This team is a family and our coaches have a lot to do with the amazing bond we share. I can't put into words how this team helped me become part of the Rockville Center community. This morning, it was very bittersweet going to the first captain's practice. I couldn't wait to be with all the girls, but it was also very upsetting thinking that our coaches will not be on the field with us in a few weeks. On behalf of the Lady Cyclones varsity team, I ask that you rethink this decision to not rehire our coaches. I can't even think that we would have to say goodbye to these two amazing people for no reason at all. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you can reconsider your decision and we can have another successful soccer season. <laughs> I'm a rising junior who has been on the team for the past two years. I cannot put into words how devastating it is to hear a part of our team is being taken away. This team is not like any other team I've ever been on. It's a family. I feel as if you need to be a part of this team to understand the bond and trust we have created with these coaches. Taking away these coaches has no benefit to my teammates and I. These coaches are irreplaceable and do not deserve this treatment after bringing home the county title this past season. It breaks my heart knowing that our Board of Education does not have the best interest for our team. The constant fight to stand up for our coaches is not what we need a couple of weeks before our season begins. I hope the Board of Education reconsiders their decision in favor of what is truly best for the girls varsity soccer team and their future. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi, I'm Reese Haley, rising sophomore at Southside High School. Last year I was a rookie on the varsity soccer team and a couple weeks into my freshman season I got injured. The coaches showed a lot of concern for me since it was difficult for me not being able to play. The coaches constantly made sure to check in on me to see how I was feeling and recovering. On top of playing during COVID, the season was difficult on most of us because our club season overlapped with the high school season, having moved to the spring. The coaches were very understanding and helped me learn the importance of communicating when I was overwhelmed. I feel so grateful to play for coaches who care about me not just as a player, but also as a person. Although our team faced many challenges with COVID throughout the season, the coaches helped to relieve the stress and make the best out of the condensed season. I'm so proud to be a part of this team where the coaches have created a positive and supportive environment. These coaches have led us to a county championship, which we hope to achieve again next year. The team as a whole is such a special group of people, and I can't imagine moving forward this season without our coaches be because it won't be the same without them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Mackenzie Cray, senior. Um, to start off, unfortunately, in the beginning of my sophomore year, very early on in the season, I tore my ACL, which was a season-ending injury. 
and having these coaches constantly checking up on me, making sure I was okay, keeping my spirits high, because watching my teammates play was heartbreaking, because all I wanted to do was be on the field with them. And having these two coaches behind me, having them to fall back on, was, I would ask for nothing else, because I don't think I would have gotten through that hard time watching my friends play without having them um, be behind me, sorry. And then after that season, I was so excited to come back and play again, coming into my junior year. Fortunately, I re-injured my knee, which led to me having another surgery. And it was heartbreaking because I had to have an, an unfortunate conversation with my head coach explaining that I re-injured my knee and I was unable to play through the whole season with my recovery timeline. And I was, I wanted to do everything I could for the team and thankfully she granted me the privilege of being manager for this team this past season. And I was very nervous coming into it because I didn't know how I was going to do be able to handle another season just watching everyone like play, have a great time, and I was so nervous about it, but they made sure my spirits were high, kept me very involved, having me do little things at practice to just like keep me like going and like it helped so much and now to find out that I'm going into my season year, finally being able to play, not knowing who my coaches are and how Two very important coaches in my life helped me through a very difficult year and a half through a pandemic, two surgeries, and now to find out that they're not my coaches is absurd and with no answers. And I'm, I speak on behalf of me and my teammates. I think we deserve transparency and to know what is the reason of our coaches coming off of a winning season not being restated, because it is absurd. And now we're a month away from the season and we have no coaches. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, Christina Lacalzi. I am an incoming senior and captain of the Southside Girls Varsity team. I've had the privilege of being a member of this team since my freshman year. This, the team has decided to attend this meeting so we can inform the board and the community of what we believe to be in the b actual best interest of the student athletes. And as you know, our team, including the head coach and the volunteer assistant coach, just completed an absolutely amazing season. Not only referring to our county title, but the close relationships we've developed among one another during the past season. The team's success was due in no small part to the focused dedication and efforts of our head coach and assistant coach. At times, the coaches were demanding and challenged us, which is what is expected of a varsity coach. And not every girl on the team agreed with every decision made, and realistically, that will never happen on any team. However, both coach always treated us with dignity and respect. The fact that this board decided to fire our head coach and assistant coach two months after honoring all of us and one month before the upcoming season begins is very upsetting. Now, if this decision was based solely on qualifications, skill, and the ability to coach at a competitive level, which is what hiring a coach should always be about, the board should have no problem rehiring them both, especially since both our superintendent and athletic director recommended them. The team finished second place in our conference and beat MacArthur 2-0 in our county championship game. This was Southside's first county championship in seven years, and I have never heard of coaches being fired the season after bringing home a county title. We as a team would like to understand how the board members who felt it was best to not rehire these coaches that brought us this success came to this conclusion. We would like to understand how this decision is, is even justified. Many of the board members have stated that they support transparency, so please be transparent with us. According to the superintendent and athletic director, neither coach has violated the conflict of interest policy that this board put in place last summer. In fact, our head coach does not even coach any team or individuals outside of the Lady Cyclones. So our question is, if these coaches have not been rehired due to any policy violations, is it because they are members of the board who have their own agenda? And if so, then we are angry. Because players on our team, including myself, were dragged in the mud over and over again regarding conflict of interest two years ago. 
Ultimately, the board has negatively impacted the athletic experience at Southside for all the girls on this team, which is unfortunate because the last three years have been amazing, despite having to endure pretty harsh accusations made by adults involving pay to play when we have worked insanely hard for positions on this team. We trusted our coaches and we trusted you all to make the right decision for us. This team is a family and we will never stop fighting for them until our family is complete again. We're heartbroken, it's just so devastating for us and hard to believe our Board of Ed can do this to their own student athletes. Thank you for your time. These young ladies are amazing. My name is Frank Van Zandt. I live at 76 Tanyard Lane in Huntington. I'm the president of the Rockville Center Teachers Association. Two Rockville Center teacher coaches who just received plaudits from this school board in June. County champions, one teacher coach, the Newsday Coach of the Year, the other a former professional athlete who will forget more soccer than we'll ever know, both in full compliance with all board policies, both no issues or problems from this school year before the vote or after the vote, both vetted by our athletic director, both vetted by our superintendent, both offered to you as the best RVC teacher coaches for the positions. And yet, you colluded to flout the recommendations of administration. You pay administrators to run the district, to do this work, and so why aren't you listening to them? Everyone concludes that a personal grudge is fueling this fire. From the teachers, TAs, and teacher coaches, I can't hold back feelings of misgivings, a lack of trust. This feels capricious. We teachers and teacher coaches feel like, who's next? What capricious decisions await us? I'm asking you to reinstate our coaches. Otherwise, there will be, as you've heard, immediate damage to the RVC soccer program, long-term damage to Rockville Center sports when teacher coaches, the fairest and most highly trained professionals at your athletic service, will be driven away from wanting to coach here. There will be damage to Rockville Center schools in needless potential legal costs, and there will be damage to the district's reputation as a thoughtful, supportive, and wonderful place to live and work. Do the hardest thing. Do the right thing. Listen to the voices of the stakeholders. The community is calling you, asking you to reconsider fix this unfairness, please approve these coaches so that they can do the job for which they are eminently qualified. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Chris Webster. I live at 38 Donald Place in East Rockaway. I've been teaching and coaching in this district for 22 years. It was only two months ago, my girls cross country team and the girls soccer team met over in that side hallway right over there. And they're all excited as they were about to be recognized and honored by this Board of Education. It was exciting for them and such a pleasure to see the happiness in their eyes and smiles as these two teams witnessed their hard work coming to fruition. The soccer coaches and I couldn't have been prouder as we shook each other's hands and considered a season well done. Now here we are two months later, and I just want to know, what happened? How did these coaches go from being honored by the district and the county to being forced out the door? 
What could have possibly happened in such a short period of time? I had been before this board many, many times in my 22 years, and it's always filled me with pride and enthusiasm to be a part of these honors. But I don't know what changed. What I do know is that as of July 1st, when the new year began and the board was restructured, one of your first items of business was to create chaos and dissent and confusion and anger. We have a community wondering why you would do this and why you would begin the year like this. We just finished one of the most difficult years ever. We've all attempted to catch our breath over the last few weeks, and now we don't know the agenda of this board, and once again, can't catch our breaths. I look at this board of education. I see a fellow coach against whom I've competed on the track against some very tough teams, and I have tremendous respect for that person. I see a parent whose children I have taught and laughed with over the years. I see a parent whose child I coached for four years and watched improve year after year. And now I look at this board and I'm afraid. What are you planning and why? I realize I don't know any of you at all. After last week's demonstration, my name was in the RVC Herald and I was quoted. The next day, people began emailing me and texting me saying, well, Webb, one who's going to get your job now that you're next on the chopping block. And when I told my wife I was coming here to speak tonight, her response was, but I thought you liked coaching. You realize that if you speak at the meeting, your coaching days are over? And I've thought a lot about that. Because what I thought was an unthinkable reason to be fired is not exactly why we are here tonight. You could be listening to me right now, and when I finish, you could simply push me out with a vote. It won't matter what the parents think, my athletes think, the community thinks, or what the athletic director recommends. A public vote, a secret discussion, and zero rationale. The Board of Ed is the voice of the community. The Board of Ed represents the community's educational beliefs, morals, culture. So this I say to you, with this particular situation, it is not two or three people trying to convince hundreds of people to rethink a vote. It's the opposite. It's hundreds of people trying to change the vote of two or three people. You've set a varsity county championship, a varsity county championship team adrift and unmoored in a sea. The community has spoken very clearly and very loudly about how they feel. And now I cross my fingers and hope that their representatives, the Board of Education, will listen to them. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Susan Lacalzi, and I live at 17 Andover Road. I am Christina Lacalzi's parent. Christina is an income senior and three-year varsity player. After seeing some things in social media, I am here to clear up any misinformation regarding a soccer recruiting tournament that occurred in Virginia back in March 2021. If this recruiting tournament was an actual issue or concern, I wish that members of the board would have approached those involved and inquired to get the truth, instead of relying on misconceptions and lies that have been spread. When we were deciding on whether to attend this recruiting tournament, one of the very few recruiting uh, opportunities available to our interested athletes, the athletic director made us aware of the school district's COVID protocols, including the requirement of a negative COVID test before returning to any school activities. We made sure that we stayed within the protocols given, and never once were we encouraged or told to lie about our travels by anyone, including the varsity head coach or assistant coach. In fact, we did not speak with the coaches regarding the district's COVID protocols. And to our knowledge, the assistant coach was not at the tournament. I am also here to express my disappointment and outrage at the timing of your vote. You invite the girls and their coaches to a special board meeting to honor them and their achievements in early June and a little over six weeks later, you vote their coaches out with a little over a month left before the seasons begin. You yanked the rug right from under them 
And worse, you left the girls in total confusion, as you did not even bother to put out a statement to let them know what kind of plan was in place to ensure their best interest and that of the program. Your actions reflect how little you care about their best interest. It is my hope that listening to all our concerns and outrage tonight, you will reconsider your poor decision and reinstate the coaches to their rightful position. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. My name is Kevin Kennedy. I live at 45 Amherst Court. I've lived here my entire life. Proudly graduated Southside High School in 1987 and just as proudly returned to teach and coach here 14 years ago. For better or worse, I currently have a perspective from multiple viewpoints. Homeowner, parent, teacher, and coach. In view of the recent situation and given my experiences in this district and this school in the past, I can come to but one conclusion. We have to be better than this. We have to be better than this for the good of our children. Yet again, we're locked in a dispute over a topic that is nearly two years old. An extracurricular activity, no less, that was adjudicated by the prior Board of Education and after a policy was instituted to prevent future issues. Yet we're stuck, like a broken record, playing the same old tune, a tune of selfishness and spite, a song of vengeance and recrimination, a tune, unfortunately, sung all too enthusiastically by the keyboard soldiers and trolls of social media. And as we adults mournfully keep the beat to this sad song, our student athletes watch and listen and learn. The lessons of leadership, of unity, of maturity normally taught within interscholastic athletics are lost as they observe neighbor pitted against neighbor. As if their lives are not inexorably changed already by the past year and a half of social distancing, of masking and hybrid learning, they, the very reason we are all here tonight, are caught yet again in the middle. It's not about us. As parents, teachers, and coaches, we are all dedicated to the lives and well-being uh, well of our children. As adults, we need to step up, find a way to listen as well as preach, to understand as well as lecture. Our children are watching. Their well-being and happiness is dependent upon it. We have to be better than this. Good evening, Patty Basil, 422 North Village Avenue. I'm here tonight to talk about the misconceptions and the lies that were spread around about the pay to play and the East Meadow Soccer Club. Four of my children all went through the Rockville Center Soccer Program. Rockville Center has a well-known and wonderful program. However, if your daughter or son wants to compete at a higher level, they need to play at a stronger, better league and Rockville Center does not offer it to those children. <clears throat> These leagues include the ECNL League. They provide players with more competition, opportunities, and college exposure. The East Meadows Soccer Club participates in two high-level leagues. The ECNL is the highest. It's very competitive and very selective. And the East Meadow Farmingdale ECRL is the next highest level. The girls who want to play on these teams have to try out, just like a high school team. Many of the girls do not make these teams. The girls that make the teams are from all over Long Island, Suffolk County, all the way out in the Hamptons. They come in to East Meadow to play on these teams. From Queens, Brooklyn, and Manhattan, they travel two to three times a week to play on these teams. 
These girls practice two or three times a week for almost the whole year with short breaks here and there. And they have games at least once or twice a weekend. So if your daughter is lucky enough to make one of these teams, she will play with stronger, faster, and better players, which will only make her stronger, faster, and better. So when these girls come back to Rockville Center and try out for their high school teams, and they've been competing at this very high level, these are the girls who are going to make the team, whether they play for East Meadow or not. The girls that stayed in Rockville Center or neighboring towns, Oceanside or Garden City, or didn't play club at all, they will not be as strong as these girls. They will not have the skill. They will not have the soccer ID. Our current county championship team is composed of many players that play on four different leagues like this. And several of the girls did not play on club at all. Three years ago, my daughter's Rockville Center team merged with the East Meadow Farmingdale ECRL team, who is coached by one of the coaches in question. Come the high school tryouts, she was hoping to make varsity, but she didn't. She made JV, she made a team, she just didn't make varsity. She worked really hard that year on JV and in her club team and proved herself the following year, and she made varsity. Although she was upset about not making varsity the first year, she was more upset about the comments, about the bullying that she and her teammates received, about the pay to play that was all over social media. It started from someone. Finally, I want to clear up the backlash about the cost of the East Meadow or these other leagues. Yes, they are expensive. However, all sports are expensive, not just soccer, not just girls' soccer. Lacrosse, try club volleyball. That's way more expensive than the soccer. Baseball and all the other sports. However, I know that the soccer program have certain scholarships for families that can't afford it. So at least there's a chance for them to play. I bet if you add up the costs of private singing lessons, piano or violin lessons, it would just be as costly. And I don't know if there are scholarships for them. My final question is to the board and Dr. Chang. Why is the girls' soccer the only team or extracurricular activity that's being targeted? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Jim Lacalzi, 17 Andover Road. First of all, I'm very proud of these young ladies. At least we know the teachers are providing them with a good education and uh, public speaking as well. So thank you, girls. Uh, this actually is a question for Mr. Gross, because I appreciate what you said, sir, at the beginning of the meeting. The fact that um, this, well, let me back up. Was this matter discussed in an executive session. That certainly couldn't be privileged whether it was discussed or not, correct? Um, I believe it is privileged. So there's no information that the board will ever provide about anything. I ended, again, I'm not asking what was discussed. I'm asking if it was discussed. I believe that's privileged, sir. So is there any transparency or information that could ever be provided by the board about anything? If we can't even ask if the subject matter was discussed, because if it wasn't discussed in executive session, my understanding is that it would be inappropriate for three board members to discuss board business, because there'd be a quorum, right? Three on this board is a quorum majority? Yes, sir. So it would be inappropriate for three board members to discuss board business outside of a board meeting or executive session. Is that correct, sir? Yeah, the open meeting. Is that correct, sir? No, 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 I am not gonna be cross-examined, Mr. Uh, I forget your name. Lukowski. Lukowski, I'm not gonna be cross-examined. You want an answer? I'll give you an answer. Okay, I wanted a yes or no, but go ahead. Well, I'm not going to be cross-examined and give a yes or no answer. 
The open meetings law of the state of New York permits discussion regarding uh, private issues involving employees in executive session. The open meetings law has been interpreted by the Committee on Open Government to permit two board members outside of an executive session to have such conversations. If three board members are conducting business outside of a properly called meeting, that is improper. Three. Okay. The um, uh, purpose is that the conduct of school business occur uh, in public. For example, mm -hmm. the vote not to uh, reappoint uh, the two Understood. coaches. However, there are countervailing reasons for the board, as I said at the outset, not to discuss performance-related, privacy-protected interests of employees. I, I hope that answers your question. Well, it was an answer. Um, but again, the fact that whether this matter was discussed, there's no privilege that you understand attaches to that. I was at the meeting, uh, executive sessions, I was present, that's privileged, if you're referring to this evening. No, I, I'm, I'm referring to prior to the vote on July 21st. Yes, sir. That was voted 3-2 with the PAR, the personal actions report, that only two of the recommended coaches were not approved for rehire. If at any time before that vote, there is a discussion in executive session about that matter those every other coach being approved other than those two uh, first I wasn't at those executive sessions but I can assure you that there's no responsibility of a board member under the law to reveal the reasons they voted one way or another I'm not saying that that's not lacking in transparency but there is no legal requirement okay so I just want to get, so I know going forward with respect to school board matters, nothing that's ever discussed in an executive session, not the details of it, but the topics are never to be revealed. Those are all no, privileged. When the board goes into executive session, they must enter executive session from an open meeting. I'm talking about meetings without council present. The, the open meetings law does not apply when council is discussing a privileged matter with, its, with his or her clients. Open meetings law, the, clearly because that interferes with the attorney-client privilege. When boards meet in executive session, they must meet into, go into executive session from an open meeting, take a vote, and identify which of the eight or nine permissible reasons under the open meetings law that they're going into executive session such as to discuss the employment history of an individual, such as a health-related issue involving uh, the school district, such as the sale of real property. So the identification of the general topic with some degree of specificity, for example, collect motion sure. to go into executive session to discuss collective bargaining with the Rockville Center Teachers Association. That uh, must be done prior to going into executive session, but that is the extent of the revelation of what's gone on in the executive session. I will add one more point, okay. that a Board of Education collectively could waive uh, uh, conversations in executive session, but not one board member, not two board members, but a majority. But again, was there a, ever an executive session regarding this PAR, these approval of these coaches for July 21st? Yeah, I, I, in a court of law, when I ask a question more than once, eventually an objection is made, asked and answered. I'm not going to answer that question. Okay, my understanding was the answer is no then. Uh, one more thing. Um, Again, based on what you said earlier, two board members, if a board constitutes five members, two could talk about board issues, but if three are together talking about board issues, that would be a violation of the law. Now, I, I, if, I, if I said that, I apologize. It, more than two conducting board business. Good. It's permissible for two board members to discuss board business, three board members can share information, but they can't deliberate on an issue. 
meaning the three of them could not be together to discuss that issue? Or are you saying they could discuss all the issues they want, they just can't come to a decision? No, the, it, 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 the, the, the need to avoid those situations relates to the conduct of business, which means deliberation, not necessarily a vote. Because my understanding, and I'm getting, it's not that I'm making these questions up, I'm getting them from the New York State Board uh, um, of Education has an association where they put out a, a pamphlet. New York State School Board's association. And, and my understanding from reading it is that school board members in a quorum, if that's three, cannot discuss any matters relating to school business because that would constitute a matter violating the open meetings law. I, again, if it involves a discussion and deliberations, talking about a topic outside of the board meeting, you're correct. However, the Committee on Open Government has clearly indicated that the sharing of information, not deliberation, but the sharing of information between more than two board members outside of the context of a board executive session is permissible. Thank you. I have all the answers. All right, Jim Hubler, 484 North Long Beach Road. All right, up until this vote, I would say I was a proud Hall of Fame alumnus at this school. Let me repeat that, Hall of Fame alumnus, proud. My name hangs on the wall like these girls now do. We're all embarrassed now by all of you, embarrassed. I'm gonna speak on why my daughters no longer play Rockville Center Soccer Club. Third, going into fourth grade, I went to the board of Rockville Center and I wanted to give back what I was given by Rockville Center. Born, bleed Rockville Center my entire life. I wanted to give back. Zero. I wanted to charge zero dollars to train girls, to give back. Rockville Center Soccer Club says, no problem, just make it fair across the board, okay. 45 girls, we're all for it. Set it up, hour and 45 minutes, three days a week, for free, my time during the summer. Did it Monday, Thursday, show up Friday, who's there? President of the soccer club. What does he say? Sorry, shutting you down. So sorry, why? Oh, because it's Rockville Center, it's not what we want. It's not what we want. You said I could do this, as long as I did it for everybody. Okay, so if I do it again now for this third group out of the 45, you're gonna shut me down? He said, yeah. I walked away, I said, go ahead. I'm not naming names, walk away. I get 43 emails that night saying, we're all for this, keep doing it. I set up a meeting with the board, sort of like I am right now, with the emails stating what each parent had to say. What does the board say back to me? What do parents know? They're just a plant in a lawn chair. Are you guys saying that to these parents right now? These girls just did the unthinkable. These coaches just did the best job of their lives through a pandemic. What are you guys teaching them? What, what, what are we teaching our kids? This is sad, it's truly sad. I'm a proud Hall of Famer. Do the right thing and reinstate these coaches because you know what? No one's gonna wanna play here. I took my kids to East Meadow after researching SUSA, SESA, all the, all the, and I found East Meadow's training to be what I wanted for my kids. And look what it's brought our kids, a national, uh, I'm sorry, a Nassau County Championship. So please do the right thing, bring them back. And I wanna say with whatever time I have left, these girls deserve this.
Kieran Conlon, uh, 63 Broadway, Rockville Center. This is a tough meeting. You know, this, this one's tough. Um, I've been here on this issue a number of times. As some of you are aware, some of you who are new to this board and this district are unaware. And you know, I, I did find it somewhat puzzling that this special meeting was called when I knew for many years, and I share the frustration that was expressed, that you as a board, as been indicated as your attorney, can't even comment on issues of personnel. So you're forced to sit here and listen, and in some cases be attacked without being able to retort. So I want to make it clear that this has nothing to do with these special girls, this varsity team. They should be very proud of their accomplishments. It was inspirational to sit here and listen to them. But simply stated, this has to do with the ethical standards and integrity demanded of those who are given the privilege to teach and coach in this school district, both now and moving forward. In 2019, I came to this board and the former superintendent and advised them that we had an issue. We had a cancer in our school district and athletic department. I urged them to take action, and I warned them of the consequences of not taking action. A year later, in 2020, I again came before this board, and I urged them to take real action and not placate the vocal few who desperately sought to maintain the status quo. I explained that many in the community who were still had children in our schools were hesitant to come forward and speak out out of fear of retaliation. I know many families and students have recently written to this board privately, and I applaud them for doing so, and I encourage anyone else who is wrong to come forward. The administrators responsible for ensuring compliance with our ethical standards chose to look the other way in 2019. The vacuum created over the last two years allowed misconduct to continue and even embolden some. As I explained last year, this cancer growing in our school community specifically with regard to athletics, in both appearance and fact was very real and would continue. I can tell you from my own experience and from reading some of the messages on social media and letters posted in chat groups, including the call to arms from the local teachers union representative, you can see why people would be hesitant to come forward and speak, as I am. This union representative speaks for the teachers that interact with our kids every day. What do you say when the union representative actively solicits and encourages other school districts to come to our village and protest in front of our school about the perceived injustice relating to a coaching matter. I hope the teachers union expends as much energy and effort reaching out to neighboring schools to collaborate on improving academic performance of the students and improving ethical standards as it has invested in the issue that's before this board today. You know, I get it. When people who feel they have the power that they've held, 
They feel it slipping away. They want to take action. I also know when the facts and the law are not on your side, when your arguments on the merits fall flat, your last desperate act is to attack the messenger and divert attention away from what's really behind the curtain. Simply stated, this is about ensuring the proper administration of school programs fairly and ethically. I remind everyone here tonight of our district's code of ethics. The code mandates that our employees, including our volunteers, act in a manner as to ensure both the reality and appearance of fairness and integrity. You may be forced for legal reasons to be silent. I am not. When the people in charge refuse to do their job, yes, people are hurt, students are hurt. When they ignore the mount mounting evidence and instead look to circumvent the rules, the board needs and did take action. Not everyone's going to like the necessary changes, but for the good of all the students and our community, these changes needed to be made. It's time to move on. This vote sends a powerful message and restores the hierarchical order for our district. That starts with you. The message is simple. If you are lucky enough and have the privilege of working with our children, you will be held to a standard of integrity and ethics that ensures fairness for all our students. And I'll end with this. The district mission statement that's on your website. The district will provide a safe, nurturing environment in which individual and civic responsibility is fostered. Diversity is respected and all students are enabled to realize their full potential. The board members have been true to that mission statement and in doing so have taken back power from those who chose to abuse it at the expense of all of our children. I applaud them. I applaud you for your vote and your commitment to pointing this district in the right direction. I also sincerely hope that with time, the dissenting voters on this board and many of the students and parents that are here tonight will come to see the merit of your actions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Christina Lacalzi. Um, it was mentioned that people have handled this situation in private matters. Well, two years ago, we handled it in private matters. And we were never applauded. We were publicly shamed multiple times on social media, people mocking us, people posting on TikTok, and then again accused for putting it out on social media and saying that we intimidated people to go against our coaches or, yeah, go against our coaches. And it's, that's just another false accusation against our team. We would never make anyone uncomfortable. You can speak your mind. We are, we are speaking our minds right now, we would never make anyone uncomfortable on social media. And that is completely false. Our girls would never do that. And they all deserve to be here. We would never do that to anybody else. And thank you for your time. Thank you.
Roxanne Rizzi, 55 Kennedy Avenue. I came to a Board of Ed meeting back in April asking for transparency on curriculum being taught in this district, in case I look familiar. You boasted about how much you care about students' social emotional learning in that conversation. So let's look these girls in the eyes and take their social emotional health into account because it doesn't look like that was done. You couldn't have been thinking of these girls in the way that this was handled. I believe that the April meeting was a catalyst for parents asking for transparency within the Rockville Center School District. Some newly elected board members ran on that transparency. So let's have at it. It's time to put your money where your mouth is. The students, the student athletes, the coaches, the parents, and the community deserve that much. Mike Basil, 422 North Village Avenue. I'll be brief. Um, we heard from Mr. Conlin at great length about ethics and conforming with policy. You've heard from multiple people this evening, and it was endorsed by your athletic director and your superintendent that the two coaches in question conformed with the newly adopted policy. No question. I am interested in how Mr. Conlin became aware of, in his word, private communications to the Board of Ed. How is that possible? Is there a leak on the Board of Ed? It's a good question. I will agree with Mr. Conlin on one point. Don't listen to the vocal few. That's him. Thank you. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Tom McNicholas, 27 Broadway. I didn't think I was going to speak tonight, but sitting in the back of the room, you know, there's something we're just kind of missing here. And, you know, I think we're, we're high school sports. You know, I just think going forward, whatever decision made is keeping the coaches, getting the coaches. What, what is, if you know, the policy for ninth and 10th graders playing varsity sports? Is there any type of time limit they need to play or anything like that? Does anyone know? We don't, we don't have a policy for that. There's no policy? No, there's an athletic advisor, you know, athletic advisor, varsity objectives, things like right. that. Right. So pretty much what I think we should do going forward is really just going through this, and my kids running through it, you know, one or two kids usually are pretty good, and those kids making varsity at, at a high level, um, I do think there should be some time limit, whatever it be, per game. Because what happens here too often, and again, some kids just want to make this team. They just want to sing on that bus. They want to play. They want to take that jersey. And listen, I'm not an every person gets a trophy kind of guy. But I am every kid should get a smile. And people don't understand that in this community, we're a tight-knit community, and me living here my whole life, and I won three county championships, I wasn't on the Hall of Fame, but we need camaraderie in this town, and we need to understand that this shouldn't be so cutthroat. Kids should get a chance to play, practice. They don't care if they're in the game. They just want to wear that jersey, Southside. So many of my friends growing up, they never played, they never touched a field, but they were part of that team. And every great player needs a great teammate. And I don't think some of these coaches understand that. This isn't a club team. I hope every one of these girls gets a tremendous athletic scholarship, and I do, I think they're excellent. I congratulate you girls. You are great players. But 
the other 10 kids and 15 kids that got cut from that team, they deserve to play and be on that team. And I'm not saying play, put the best team on the field. I'm the most competitive person, anyone who knows me. But these kids now go home and they just got cut. Why? Because we can't have a jersey for them. Our budget's big enough that we should give every kid a jersey. Roster permitting. I'm not talking about basketball. Cuts are made and it's hard to do. But I'm talking about a 30-person roster on a soccer team. 17 kids might play. The other 13 might sit. But those 13 kids are part of the team. They're rooting on their teammates. They're sitting on the sideline. They're wearing that jersey. And when I won a county championship, I started every game, whatever it was. But my teammates at the end of the bench, they were my friends. And they're still my friends to this day. And I think we're missing that. And we're missing that going forward. And yes, I did. Yes, I did. We had 26 guys. Sorry, not the name. But my, excuse but my, me, excuse but my me. point is, excuse to, me. my point to the matter is that kids in this town get cut and they shouldn't get cut if we have enough jerseys. We have enough. It's not about, I will donate the jerseys. This isn't about that. This is about kids that now mental health these days need to understand and be part of something. Be part of something. And that's all I ask going forward. I hear teachers are from Huntington, they're from East Rockaway, and I applaud that. I'm from Rockville Center, and people don't know how much of a tight-knit community this is. And to me, to see my friends on both sides of this, doing this and being in this situation should have never happened. Never happened. And that's the problem. So going forward, all I ask for you as a board, no matter what you do, is educate the coaches. And that's all I'm saying. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Megan Zellis, 27 Leon Court. I also did not think I was gonna speak this evening, so please just bear with me with the thoughts I've put together. I would like to start by saying that I support all of our student athletes. My comments this evening do not take away from any of their hard work. I think the fact that so many of these talented and well-spoken young women got up and spoke is a tri great attribute to their ethics. My comments this evening, as I mentioned, do not take away from any of their hard work. I would also like to acknowledge that our coaches often play more important roles in our children's lives than our classroom teachers. I know that lessons learned on the field or court are extremely important life lessons. I also feel it's very important to know that there are two sides to every story. I wish more <coughs> students from the other side of this situation felt comfortable coming forward. Unfortunately, they are not. They have been harassed themselves. They are scared to come forward and afraid of the retribution that they will face if they did. I think that's apparent by the comments and snickers going on in this room as the select few of us have chosen to, get for to stand forward. I know my own children at home are going to be very upset that I got up and spoke this evening. And that is not something that should happen. While I recognize that athletes look to play on the most competitive travel team available, I also recognize the conflict of interest of having the same coach for both. This is not a club team. This is a high school team. We should be encouraging athletes as an extension of learning. Every student should have an opportunity to try out in a fair and equitable manner. I had two children that have gone, come through the high school already. They have both played at the JV and varsity level. However, there is a reason why neither one of them continued with soccer. Maybe one might not have been good enough to eventually make varsity, but one was. There is a reason her, almost every girl from her grade, she was a 2016 freshman, did not continue on to make varsity. And I think it's very apparent at this point why that happened. None of them played for East Meadow. None of them coached privately with an unsaid assistant coach. Much has been said about the board acting in the best interest of students. I believe their decision is in the best interest for the good of many rather than the good for a select few, and more importantly, for the overall success of Southside Athletic Program, which leads me to the most important point. This program starts at the top. If leadership, specifically the athletic director and superintendent, put a stop to this years ago, we wouldn't be in this place now. We wouldn't be a community divided. I think the place we have gotten to is very sad and troubling. 
While the timing of this decision is unfortunate, it is important to understand that the athletic director just handed the board the approvals. The board was not in control of timing. So again, this is a problem from the top. If leadership took control years ago, we would not be here today. I would like the board and the community to know that there are people that support this decision. And we are hopeful that by this decision, the Southside program, the soccer program at Southside can rise to the elite status it once had. But more importantly, to give every student athlete in every sport a fair and equitable chance. As many people have mentioned, we are coming off a very difficult and decisive, divisive year. Let's come together and stop attacking the board we elected. Let's lead by example and show our student athletes how to rise above the noise, how to prove themselves on the field, and how to put the good of the program first. It is the best interest of the future of this program to move forward with fresh leadership. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, I also wasn't planning on speaking tonight. Um, I did send in a letter, but I am a former Lady Cyclone. I do just want to say from the bottom of my heart, I am so impressed with every single one of you that got up here and said something because I'm even nervous right now. I couldn't do it when I was 15, 16, 17 years old. Um, but anyway, Kayla Hasbaka, 163 Hempstead Avenue. Um, I was a four-year member of the Southside Varsity Soccer Team. My high school experience as a Lady Cyclone is one that I will never forget. Much like me, and I'm sure a lot of these other girls, playing on the Lady Cyclones was a dream of mine since attending kickoff as a little girl. I've been so proud to represent Southside as a whole, and especially the Lady Cyclones. The current circumstances surrounding this program truly baffle and sadden me and my former teammates. And like people who went here said, it is truly embarrassing that this is going on. Um, throughout my high school career, I played club soccer for Albertson Fury on an ECNL club team. I played for the Lady Cyclones all four years and continued to play Division I soccer at the University of Buffalo. To this day, being a Lady Cyclone was one of the most rewarding and positive experiences that helped to build my character, not only on the field, but off it and in the classroom as well. Soccer season was one of the best times of the year at Southside, not only for the girls on the team, but the camaraderie throughout the entire school. Everyone was supporting everyone. We spent so much time together and our chemistry and hard work is what led to our successes. Being a student athlete has taught me numerous life lessons. Hard work and dedication are a must for all student athletes. However, the ability to overcome adversity, accepting your failures and learning from them is what leads to greatness. Our soccer coaches created a thriving environment that fully instilled and supported our team camaraderie and dedication. Our team won stu two state championships and three county, cyclone, county titles during my time as a Lady Cyclone. Was my assistant coach sophomore through senior year, helping lead us to our successes. He was an amazing coach. He knows the game and knows what it takes to excel as a competitive, at a competitive level and as a former collegiate and professional player. Yes, he was hard on us, just like any other coach you'll ever face. He pushed us all of us, all of us to achieve our full potential as soccer players and young women. Hard work is something that is required in all sports across the board, and sometimes it's really hard to accept that Sometimes it's not enough. And this whole pay to play thing, I don't even know the logistics behind all of it, but I was a cub player. I trained by myself. I trained with other people. I wanted to get to that next level. And to do so, you had to leave Rockville Center. And yeah, I played on Southside and so did a lot of my teammates as well. That's just the name of the game and that's life. Anyway, um, Last year with these girls was the first time since my senior year in 2014 that Lady Sick won a county championship. This was a great achievement for all student athletes and coaches involved with the program during such a volatile year due to the pandemic. 
The head coach was named Newsday Coach of the Year for her guidance and achievements of the team. I simply do not understand how these coaches can be dismissed two months after such recognition and within a few weeks of their season beginning. Something just simply does not add up. Historically, Southside is known for its strong and highly competitive women's soccer program. The current situation surrounding Southside soccer reflect, reflects negatively on the whole entire district. I sincerely hope this situation will be resolved for the future of all student athletes. Thanks for your time. You. All right. I see nobody else. Nobody else wants to come to the mic. Um, at this point, I'll ask if any of the board members would like to say anything. Erica. Tara? I want to thank everybody for coming, especially the girls. Um, I just want to say a couple of things, not really so much about some of the past, but just I could talk about myself and I'll tell you some of the things that I really meant. I really meant it when I decided to run for this board because I really wanted to do something good for this community and I, I really did it with the best of intentions. When we had this issue rise two years ago and we met with the coaches and we heard what they had to say and we tried to come up with a solution, I really did mean that too. When I invited you girls to the meeting and, and praised you in public and we took a photo, I meant that too. And I meant my vote. I meant my vote to approve the coaches. I don't take any of it back. I'm really sorry this happened. I'm proud of all of you. And I really do hope we could find a way to move forward because we are going backwards. But we all meant it when we said we wanted to move forward and I'm really sorry that this happened. I'd just like to echo and say thank you to all the girls especially and everyone who came up to the mic tonight to share their feelings and all of you who have written in to us as well. And I'm really hopeful that we will do our best to move forward together for, so that you can have a productive school year, both in the classroom and on the field. Thank you. Since I'm unable to say any of the reasons why I made my decision, I can simply say that I made this decision based solely on what is in the best interest of all of the children of Rockville Center. Not a select few, but all. I've given my time in this community for over 12 years. I have volunteered at every level of this school district. And I've done all of that with a singular purpose, and my singular purpose has been for the children of Rockville Center. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Sure. Okay. That's all right. Really Eric, I don't think your mic's on. Wait till it's green. Sorry. Um, this is really addressed to the ladies, the girls on the soccer team who came tonight. I understand that this situation has caused many of you a great deal of stress, and for that, I am truly sorry. I want you to remember that it is you who holds the power for a productive and meaningful reset. Right now, you must move forward, set the norms for your team, dedicate yourselves to each other, establish your goals, and work towards them relentlessly. Continue the legacy that is Southside Girls Soccer. If you commit to this, there is no doubt that you will create your success. And regardless of what win your win-loss record is, regardless of if you bring back a championship, your season will be nothing short of excellent. Thank you. I'd, I'd just like to say the same to the Lady Cyclones that are here tonight, that your, your courage and courageous voices and how you express yourself, you should be proud of yourself as uh, Jim Lukowski said, or somebody said, you, you know, you've learned something here at Southside. Um, I'd like to also to reach out to all the 
alumni of Lady Cyclones and, and how they reached out to us and, 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 and spoke to us in, in emails, but not in public. Uh, this, this vote was not taken easily, as some people point out, as some people make a reference to, and it was a very conscious thought. And we, we came to our decision, the majority of the board, and that's, what, that's how the board moves forward. So that is the way we will move forward. The vote is what it is. So. Um, the public asked for this. That's why we did it. And we're not, uh, excuse me, you know, listen. Excuse me? I didn't placate you. You wanted to come and speak, so that's where you are. So anyway, can I have a motion to adjourn, please? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So you're not in favor of adjourning? We made a motion to adjourn. Excuse me? It's what? Okay. We, only, we have a majority to adjourn? Yes. Or, yes. Yes. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Four of us. We're adjourned. Thank you for coming.